hey folks, we're back. And now we're going to talk about bailments. So we've talked about organizations. We have talked about agency. We've even talked about the types of contracts that we can form. So let's look at something a little bit related to contracts, bailments. So personal property can be called personality chattels. You're going to see that a lot when we look at torts. It is essentially the ownership of anything other than real estate or real property. So personality or chattels is anything other than real estate or real property. And within chattels, just because I like the word, tangible personal property has substance, can be touched. Intangible, the exact opposite. Not perceptible, cannot be touched. So, personal property. Fountain pen, hamburger, anything you can actually own. Physically touch and see. Intangible. Trademark. Copyright. Well, Professor Finn, you can get documents that prove you have it, which means you have a piece of paper that states it exists, but not the item itself. That's what we're looking at. That's the core of this. An interest in an intangible personal property is also called a chosen action, which means evidence of the right to property, but not the property itself. When property is physically attached to real property, it becomes known as a fixture. It becomes part of the real property. If a business tenant physically attaches a personal property that is necessary to carry on the trade of business, to the real property that they're using, it then becomes a trade fixture. Those may be removed by the business tenant upon termination of the tenancy. So, a person leases a warehouse from you and they open up a crematory. They open up a crematory and they bring in uh, a retort made by any one of the big manufacturers, B&L in Largo, Florida, Matthews, I think they're up in Apopka, U.S. Cremation, any of these guys. And you load in the $1,000 retort, hook it all up and all of that. It's your business relationship with the warehouse. If you call it a trade fixture, you can take it and drag it somewhere else. Why would you want to do that? If you're making some money moving to a larger facility, that may be up to you. But realistically, those things are not cheap to move. But you may want to do that. However, what if they attach a sink? What if they attach a sink? They may not consider that a trade fixture, depending on the terms of their lease. And we'll talk about leases and all that in tenancy in a, in a future lecture. So for the most part, if it's there when you got there, it's a fixture, you leave it. If you replaced it, that might be subject for some discussion. Warranties. Sellers of goods often guarantee their products by making promises or statements of fact about them. This is known as an express warranty. It comes about when sellers make statements of fact or promises about the goods described in or show samples of them. Statements made by sellers that are opinions and attempts to put their goods in the best possible light are not warranties, but known as bullcrap or puffing, being the proper legal term for it. Okay? So you have to be able to distinguish between a warranty that is made and salesman puffery. I've seen it in some texts, just flat out, not a bold-faced lie, but something painted to look as if it is better than maybe what it actually is. A full warranty is given for consumer goods, and the seller must repair or replace without cost to the buyer defective goods or else refund the purchase price. This is a full warranty. It doesn't work. Either replace it without cost or they refund your money. An express warranty that does less must be labeled a limited warranty, which is why typically anything that you buy from anywhere has a limited warranty on it. An implied warranty is one that is imposed by law rather than given voluntarily by the seller, and there are two of them that are of interest. And we are going to discuss this again in the mortuary, mortuary law chapters um, when it talks about both of these, warranty for mercantility and Warranty for fitness for a particular purpose. So the warranty of merchantability is made whenever merchants sell goods. It is not given by private parties. That's important. A merchant is a person who sells goods of the kind sold in the ordinary course of their business 
or who has knowledge or skills peculiar to the goods, which is where we would fall in as funeral directors. Okay? So just to throw you a little bit of a loop, you have an individual who runs a business selling urns, handcrafted wooden urns, and produces them on a regular basis. What happens if the individual takes these same urns, goes to a neighbor's house, and then offers them for sale at a neighbor's yard sale? Wouldn't that be interesting? Is he a merchant, a person who sells goods of the kind sold in the ordinary course of business, knowledge of skills? Yes. Yes. Are they acting as a private party? That would be the interesting concept. I'd probably say err on the side of merchant were I you. The warranty of fitness for a particular purpose is made when any buyer relies on a seller's skill and judgment in selecting the goods. Implied warranties may be excluded by the seller by indicating in a conspicuous fashion that they are excluded by writing as is or with all faults in the sales slip. Exclusion of these warranties is not effective when express warranties are made for consumer good. So a warranty of fitness for a particular purpose is made when any person relying on you selects that goods for the purpose that they intend it to be. They choose the casket for their grandma. You are, for the most part, making a warranty of fitness for a particular purpose that when they're carrying it by its handles, those handles will not come off. A final warranty is warranty of title. This warrants that the title, ownership, being good. The transfer is rightful and that no unknown liens on the goods exist. The warranty cannot be excluded by the seller. And a warranty of title uh, is typically associated with tracts of land, especially tracts of land. You do a warrant or title search on it, you pay for title insurance. It also happens on automobiles. Automobiles. Anything that there is a title to. Um, commonly, as required by law or even title when it comes to just inherent rights of ownership to a chattel itself. So a bailment occurs whenever one person places personal property in the possession of another person without intending to transfer title to that person. You are giving something to someone for use, but you retain the ownership. It is yours. You are loaning it to somebody. The one who owns the goods and places them in the possession of another is the bailor. The person receiving the goods is the bailee. Be careful. It is not a bailment. You are given something, you use it, and you replace it with something identical. That's called a mutuum. Because the original item was used up in its entirety. It no longer exists. Bailment refers to a piece of property that is given, is used, and is returned. The identical piece of property. Okay? A mutual benefit bailment occurs when both the bailor and bailee benefit from the transaction. In this type of bailment, the person using it, the bailee, owes a duty to use ordinary care toward the property and would be responsible for ordinary negligence if the goods were lost or damaged. So, mutual benefit, you're both getting something out of it, utilize ordinary care, and you're going to be responsible if you, used, if you didn't do what you would norm normally do in that situation. Okay? Gratuitous bailment is one in which no consideration is given by one of the parties in exchange for the benefits bestowed by the other. It may be for the sole benefit of either the bailor or the bailee. In a bailment for the sole benefit of the bailor, the bailee owes a duty to exercise slight care over the property and would be responsible for only gross negligence because they're receiving no benefit. So, let's go back. Stop right here and go back. Look at this mutual benefit. Guy comes over, says, hey, can I borrow your lawn mower? I need to mow my lawn, and if you let me mow my lawn, I will do your lawn as well for free. So do we have a mutual benefit? 
Baylor is benefiting, definitely, by loaning the lawnmower out. I get my lawn for free, and he gets to cut his lawn. Did the Bailey benefit? Definitely. So the Bailey is going to have to use ordinary care. Treat it with respect. Not, you know, run it over cinder blocks or anything. And if something goes wrong in its normal use, needs gas or something, might, you know, say a spark plug burnt out when they're using it, meh, probably going to be responsible if it burned out because of their negligence. Regular, everyday negligence. Sole benefit of the bailor. You loan the same guy, the lawnmower, just for your benefit of him mowing your lawn. Period. That sounds like a downright crappy situation. Well, the person using the equipment only has to exercise slight care over the lawnmower and would only be responsible if something was totally stupid on their part. So, I mean, we're looking at like Darwin Award winning use here. They take it and they are knowingly running this thing over two by fours and rocks and all sorts of other stuff. So by the time you get it back, it is destroyed. Like it still turns on, but the blades are completely shot. There's holes through the chassis. It's done. That would be like gross negligence. So benefit of the Bailey. The Bailey owes a great duty of care with the property and would be responsible for even slight negligence in the event of loss or damage. So you go and you use the lawnmower to mow your lawn without doing the owner's lawn. You need to make sure that thing is probably in better condition than you received it. Right? Great duty of care. Because if you run it over, um, if you know that running it over a loose gravel driveway with the blades running is going to dent the blades, maybe put a hole uh, or scratch the paint, rip the paint off the side from shooting the rock through it, you would probably be held liable for that. And the last one, a tortious bailee is one who has intentionally or wrongfully possessed another's goods. So think about that. They haven't stolen it. Okay, they haven't stolen it. That's going to lead into another tort um, for a much deeper conversation. Conversion, for instance. Okay? Or under the modern penal code, theft. But a tortious bailee is one who has intentionally wrongfully possessed another's goods. They take the lawnmower, and now they are not giving it back. Maybe they're not returning calls. Maybe you don't know if they've stolen it or not, period, where it's not a crime, but they're also not bringing it back to you. So kind of keep those things in mind for the future when we start looking about at torts. Folks, thank you for your attention. We will see you next time.